All right, so today we're going to learn what I think is the most fun word that we learn in here to say. I think it's, I think it's going to be impossible for you guys to say this word without smiling. You have to at least smile when you say it, all right? You're doubtful. I know. I, I, I can see it on your faces. You're doubtful. We're going to say the word stoichiometry. <laughs> see? I mean, some of you bust out laughing just when I say it. We're going to say the word stoichiometry together, okay, on the count of three. And you're not going to be able to do it without smiling. I, can, I just know it's going to happen. So on the count of three. One, two, three. Stoichiometry. <laughs> Say it with me one more time. Okay. Stoichiometry. <laughs> Man, that's good. That's good. Some of you guys, see, you got the mask in front of you, so I don't know if you actually were able to do it. But we had one student. You know, we'll give Caden... We'll give Kate the points just for being able to keep a straight face while he did that. Nice job. Got it right there. All right. Um, so stoichiometry. Stoichiometry is, is it's funny. I've heard kids in the past say, oh, stoichiometry is the hardest part. You know, and they get, um, or they've heard it from other students. And so they come in here and when we're going to learn stoichiometry, they get really nervous and think it's really hard. Stoichiometry is not hard. Stoichiometry is it, everything that we've been doing up to this point where we've been doing unit conversions. So did you guys have trouble converting from feet to inches? Any problem with that? Everybody here comfortable with doing that? Um, some of you had some trouble converting from uh, Celsius to Fahrenheit on, on the last test, but that's a little more complicated. Um, but even that's not, typical, not particularly hard. You just gotta remember the formula for it, right? But doing unit conversion is a pretty easy concept. We've done that before. We've done that. You've done that in math. You've done that in other science classes. That's really all that's going on with stoichiometry. And so as we get into it, you'll understand what I mean by that, why I say that's the case. But if you'll just think about it as unit conversions, you'll do fine. Um, look on, at the periodic table. Look at calcium. All right? Calcium is number, what's the atomic number for calcium? It's number 20 on our periodic chart. If I were to ask you what the atomic mass of calcium was, what would you tell me? Calcium is 40.08. 40.08. There were like eight of you that said that, so I can't give one person credit for that. So thank you for participating. Um, 40.08, what, what would unit would that be? AMU. AMU. Who was the first one that said that? I thought I heard Elizabeth say AMU. All right. So 40.08 AMU stands for atomic mass units, right? So 40.08 atomic mass units would be the atomic mass of a single calcium atom, right? Now, when we were looking at that, um, I, I told you what one AMU was equal to. And I don't know if you remember this because I didn't have you memorize this. Um, you're welcome. That I didn't make you memorize the fact that one AMU is equal to 1.66 times 10 to the negative 24 grams. So that's what we said one AMU was equal to. All right. And so based on that, if I were to ask you um, how many, so that's the, this is the atomic mass of a single calcium atom. And so if I asked you how many grams does a single, uh, what, what's the mass of a single calcium atom, then you would take this unit conversion right here and you would say, well, that's going to be 40.0 AMU times um, one, one AMU is equal to 1.66 times 10 to the negative 24 grams. And you do that calculation and you would come up with 6.653 6.653 times 10 to the negative 23 grams per atom. All right, so for, 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 for one atom, it's 6.653 times 10 to the negative 23rd grams. All right? Um, now what if I said, tell me then how many atoms are in 40.08 grams of calcium. So if I have 40.08 grams of calcium, how many atoms would be in that many grams of calcium? You'll, you'll see where I'm going with this in just a second. Um, where did I get 40.08? Well, that's the number of grams. It has, it's, that's the same number of grams as we had 
number of AMUs as far as the atomic mass of calcium goes, right? So if I want to find out how many um, atoms are in 40.08 grams, well, what I would do is I would say there's some unknown, some number of atoms over here, right? Times that many, um, I'm sorry, I would do it like this, actually. I would do some number of atoms times 6.653 times 10 to the negative 23rd um, grams per atom equals um, 40.08 AM, uh, 40.08 grams. So in 40.08 grams, how many atoms are there? Well, if I know, I, I'm trying to figure out what this number is here. The number of atoms times what one, what the, the mass is of one atom, is got to equal 40.08. So when I solve that equation, it's going to be the number of atoms is equal to uh, 40.08 grams divided by 6.653 times 10 to the negative 23 grams per atom. And so when I punch that in my calculator, I would get, the, I would get this number here. 6.02 times 10 to the 23 atoms. Does that number look... It's a mole. <sighs> I hate it when someone gives the punchline before the joke's over, man. <laughs> <sighs> I just did that. Oh, were you talking about are you talking about what was on the side of my face? It's a mole. What were you what were you actually referring to? Maybe I misunderstood you. <laughs> um, he's right. He's exactly right. So Jed got it before I got there. That number should look familiar. That is a mole, right? That equals one mole. So one mole of calcium, right? Uh, this is 6.023. 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd calcium atoms, which equals one mole of calcium. Why leave the E off? Huh? Why leave the E off? Why leave the E off? Because, um, I do. <laughs> <laughs> because we're going to do a problem in a minute where it's moles versus molecules. Uh, and um, and yeah. mole we use way more than molecules does, so I just shortened it to, I, I just have this thing when I do an abbreviation, it can't be more than three letters, you know, so I do that all the time when I'm taking like Bible notes and I'm writing like a book of the Bible. It's always got to be three characters. And so I just, I just do three character abbreviations. I don't know. They, they probably don't do that in the book. They probably write it all out, right? But if you see MOL, that's what I'm referring to as moles. Yes. I thought you were saying, why does it say This is just some the number of atoms. So this is the, yeah, let me, if this is, makes that clear, number of atoms. All right, that's what I'm referring to there. Number of atoms. So here's the point. I went through all of that calculation there. I don't expect you guys to remember that, but I went through that entire calculation to show you that if I'm trying to see how many atoms are in uh, the same number of grams of calcium as the AMU that's listed in the book, the atomic mass of calcium, then that number turns out to be our mole, our mole number, what we learned. We learned that one mole, and I'll put the E on there for you this time. One mole equals 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, right? And as it turns out, that's why we have that number in our periodic table. The number that's underneath each element in the periodic table, that's how many grams of that element you would need to have one mole of atoms of that element, okay? So that's what AMU actually represents. That's what the atomic mass um, tells us. It tells us the number of grams of that atom, we would uh, that element we need in order to have a, one mole of atoms. All right. Remember a mole. A moles don't don't get confused about the whole mole concept. What the mole concept it, it works just like the word dozen. We use a dozen. If I have a dozen chairs, then we know we have 12 chairs, right? If I have a mole of chairs, then it means we have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd chairs. We've got a whole lot of chairs, right? It's a lot of chairs. Um, but that's all it is. It's just a num It's just a, a, a word that, that signifies 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd or something, okay? Um, so this I did not have you guys memorize. This I do want you to memorize. So I want you to remember that one mole equals 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Now, since all of you guys had a big party, 
you know, celebrated Mole Day back on October the 23rd from 6.02 in the morning to 6.02 in the evening, then you're, got, you're not going to have any trouble remembering that because I know that you guys were partying down because I got some of the pictures, right, while you guys were celebrating with the moles in your neighborhood. So thank you guys for supporting Mole Day. Um, but that will that'll help you remember that if you can remember October the 23rd at 6.02. Um, all right, so let's see. Um, so the, let me just write this down. Let me be explicit with it. So the number... Will someone, uh, will you guys shut that door? Thank you. So the number under an element, um, I'm talking about on the periodic table, tells us two things, right? One, it tells us the mass of a single atom in AMU, right? We looked at calcium, we saw 40.08 under it, and that meant that the atomic mass of calcium for a single calcium atom is, is 40.08 AMUs. And it also tells us the number of grams you need to have one mole of those atoms. So for calcium, again, if I wanted if I wanted to have in my in my beaker, right, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd calcium atoms, then I would measure out 40.08 grams of calcium. Okay? So the number underneath tells you the mass of a single atom in AMU, and it also tells you the number of grams you need to have one mole of those atoms. So, if we look at another element on the periodic table, for example, aluminum. Aluminum is number 13, has an atomic number of 13. The number underneath aluminum is 26.98. So for aluminum, the mass of a single, um, let's see, mass of single, Aluminum atom is, what did I say the number was? 26.98, 26.98 AMU. If I have 26.98 grams, right? Not AMU, but grams of aluminum, I have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd for one mole um, aluminum atoms. So in other words, one mole of aluminum is equivalent to 26.98 grams of aluminum. Now, we call this the atomic mass. That's what I told you before. That's how we refer to that. You've seen that term previously. We call this the molar mass. 
right? So in the case of aluminum, if I said, what is the atomic mass of aluminum, then you would say it's 26.98 AMUs. Again, just taking the number directly from the periodic table, right? The only thing that would change if I asked you for the molar mass is you would say grams instead of AMUs. Because one mole of aluminum is equal to 26.98 grams. That would be the molar mass. Okay? Is that clear to everybody? And why is this important? Well, because in a lab, we can't work with individual molecules or atoms, right? They're way too small to do that. And so by knowing uh, what one mole of that substance is equal to, then we can work with these chemicals in the lab based on a much larger amount, right? We can say, I, I need a mole of, of aluminum, and so I measure out 26.98 grams of aluminum, and I know I'm working with one mole. Okay, I know that I'm working with 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. So that's why this concept's important, because these are so small, we need, we need a larger amount to work with in the lab, okay? And we'll see the significance of that when we start looking at chemical equations towards the end of this lecture. Any questions about that so far before we do an example? By the way, this number here, I totally misspell it down the page. It's called, is it Av A or O? The God Droz number. So if you ever hear that term, Avogadro's number, it's referring to the 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Is it with a... Make sure I spell that correctly. It's, it is an O. I thought it was an O. My notes said A. There we go. Avogadro's number. Sorry, class. We have a disruptive student here today. What's up? I need you to... Okay. Because you can't wait until... No, that's fine. That's fine. No problem. You're on film, by the way, so I got you on film. <laughs> See you. Um, all right, so questions about any of that before we move on? I want to make sure that, that it's clear. It'll be clear, I think, as we do some examples, but um, if you've got any pressing questions now, we can go ahead and talk about that. All right, so... There was an experiment, we didn't do it in class, but I talked about it, and it's where, I think you took denatured alcohol and water, and I had mentioned how um, volume is not additive. So when we learned about, when we learned that molecules, that atoms are mostly made up of space, and molecules are mostly made up of space, and then when you combine, when you mix these together, that um, they will go down in between those empty spaces. And so with denatured alcohol and water, when you mix them together, if you take 25 milliliters of denatured alcohol and mix it with 25 milliliters of water, when you combine them together, you don't have 50 milliliters like you'd expect that you would. It's not 25 plus 25. It actually was less, and it's because the denatured alcohol would get down in the middle of the water molecules and it would actually take, take up less space. But if you measured out um, 10 grams of water and you combined it with 10 grams uh, and, and you and you 10 grams of water and 10 grams of denatured alcohol, and you put those in one container, you are going to have 20 grams total because mass is additive like that, all right? Whatever mass you started with, that's the mass that you end up with. And so because of that, um, in the, in, 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 when we're doing stuff like this with mass, it is additive. So just like I said here that the mass of one, um, that the uh, molar mass of one uh, aluminum uh, atom is 26.98, if I asked you what the molar mass was of Al2, you would just do 2 times 26.98, right, which would be around, uh, what would that be, around 54, right? You just add those up together. So we're gonna, that's going to be important in our next example, okay? So let's go to page 199, page 199. An example. Um, what is the mass of a single molecule of glucose? And the chemical equation for glucose, the chemical formula is C6H12O6. So C6H12O6. And they ask us what is the 
What is the mass of a single molecule? So here they didn't specify if they wanted the mass in grams, so the easy thing for us to do is just figure out the mass in AMU. And like I said, mass is additive. So um, I've got six carbon atoms. When I look on the periodic table for carbon, I see that carbon has an atomic mass of 12.01, right? Carbon is 12.01 AMU. I look at hydrogen. Hydrogen is 1.01 AMU. That's the atomic mass of hydrogen. And then for oxygen, the atomic mass is 16.00 AMUs. Does everybody see that? I'm just pulling that from the periodic table. That's just a number underneath each of those elements on the periodic table. So if I want to find the mass for the molecule, then I just take each of these masses, multiply each one by the number of atoms of each of those elements that I have, and then add all that together, and that'll give me the total mass. Okay? So for carbon, we have six carbon atoms. So six times 12.01 is going to be carbon, right? This is carbon. Plus, for hydrogen, we have 12 of those. So 12 times 1.01, that's hydrogen. Plus, um, for oxygen, we have six of those. Six times 16.00, that'll take oxygen into account. And that gives us a final number of 180 180.18 AMU. So that's the first part to this question. What is the mass of a single molecule of glucose? It's that. It has an atomic mass of 180.18 AMU. Yes? How would you add those together? Would you use like a calculator? Um, yeah, I just I would just multiply this out and then you know you could just you could do it just like that in your calculator using parentheses and all. Just add all that together. <coughs> Bless you. Um, so yeah, you're always welcome to use a calculator in here. Um, but that is an important point. When you start working with some of these numbers and you're working with scientific notation, make sure you know how to use your calculator, right? Some of these mistakes are just calculator error. Yes? Do we, when we're doing this, if we do this on the test weekly, do we need to put AMU inside all those five dots? In here? No, I'm not concerned about that. I do want to see the final unit. Okay. I'm not as concerned inside there. I'll show you in a minute where it does. it is important not for me to see it, um, but it's going to be important for you so that you don't make a mistake to put, make sure you put your units inside your calculator sheets. Yes. So if it doesn't specify what, what, okay, what unit it comes from, do we just do AMU? Yeah, if they just ask you for the, for what the mass of it is or the atomic mass, then you just do AMU. That's the easiest. If they were to say grams, then you would have to, you would still figure this out. But we just said a minute ago that 1 AMU is equal to 1.66, I think it was times 10 to the negative 22 grams, right? So you'd have to take that number there, and you'd have to multiply it times 1.66 times 10 to the negative 22, and then whatever that answer was would be the number of grams, okay? But yeah, if it's in AMU, that's, that's all you need. If it just asks for mass and doesn't specify, it's just give you that. The next part of the question is, what is the mass of a sample of glucose if it contains 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules? So what is the mass if it has 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules? And what is 6.02 times 10 to the 23? That is one mole, right? So it's what it's actually asking in this is, what is the mass of a sample of glucose if it contains one mole of glucose? And we know the answer from that now that we've calculated the AMU. We know, because that's the AMU for that molecule, we know that one mole of that molecule, I'll do the E one more time for Lily's sake, we know that one mole of that molecule is equal to 180.18 grams of that molecule. Okay? And so when it says, what's the mass of a sample of glucose if it contains one mole of molecules? It's that. Okay? That, we, we, why did I use grams on that one? Because It's because that's the relationship that we know. We know how mole is related to grams. We figure that out by finding the AMU. But once we find the AMU, then we, uh, we know that that means one mole of that substance is equal to that many grams of that substance. So that's the easiest way to answer the second part of the question. Okay? We're going to do a bunch of these. So if it's, getting, if it's a little bit fuzzy now... Uh, it might be better to just wait until we do a few more, and hopefully it'll become clear.
All right, um, so this is the molar mass, right? Like I said a minute ago, this is the molar mass of C6H12O6. That's how much, that's the mass of one mole of that compound, okay? Let's do another example. Page 207.2 is the example. It says in this one, a student, a student measures out 15.6 grams of magnesium chloride. So 15.6 grams of magnesium chloride. The question is how many moles does he have? And then how many molecules does he have? So um, how many moles? How many molecules? Okay, um, so the first thing that we're asked to find is um, the number of moles and in order to do that, we need to figure out the relationship. Um, uh, this was 15.6 grams, I forgot to put that. Yeah, we need to know the relationship between moles and grams as it relates to this substance. So what's the first thing that we're gonna have to calculate? What did we just learn was the relationship between moles and grams for a particular substance. If we can find its atomic mass in AMU, and whatever that number is, then we know that one mole of that substance equals that many grams of that substance. So we need to first calculate the atomic mass of magnesium chloride. In order to do that, we've got to know what the formula is for magnesium chloride, right? We've got to know how many magnesium atoms we have and how many chlorine atoms we have. Well, you can do that because we did that last chapter and we did that in the chapter before. So magnesium chloride, what kind of compound is that? Ionic or covalent? Ionic because it's a metal and a non-metal. Magnesium is a metal, right? And so if we call this a metal and a non-metal, then they're going to split apart into ions, right? Um, and so what we've got to figure out is what is the what is the charge on each of these when it becomes an ion. Magnesium is in column two A on your periodic table, right? So it's got two valence electrons that it's going to get rid of, and so when it does that, it's going to carry a two plus charge as an ion. Chlorine, it's got seven, it's in column 7A, seven valence electrons, so it's going to gain one electron, and since it's going to have an extra electron, it's going to carry a negative, a one negative charge, right? And so what's the next step to figure out the formula? Swap and drop, right? So when we swap and drop magnesium, um, the formula for magnesium chloride becomes MgCl2, right? So now that we know the formula for that, we can figure out the atomic mass of MgCl2. How do we do that? We just did it for uh, C6H12O6. Yes? Do we look for the atomic mass of each of the elements individually? Yep, and, and multiply them by however many number of those that we have, and you add all that up, right? So um, so we go to the periodic table. We have, for, for magnesium, we only have one of those. So one times, what's the? 24.31. 24.31. All right, plus for chlorine? 35.45. Uh, whoops, that's, that's times two. I didn't put my two first, but we've got two of those, so times two. So when we add, when we multiply and then add all of that up, we come up with 95.21, 95.21 as the atomic mass for magnesium chloride. And um, you are Jerry. I got confused when we were off that week. I had like these things in my head to keep, help keep track of at night. I forgot what I used. Um, 95.21 AMU. So that means that for one mole of MgCl2, if we have one mole of MgCl2, the mass of that is 95.21 grams of MgCl2. All right? 
That is our conversion relationship for this compound between moles and grams. One mole of that substance is equal to 95.21 grams of that substance. And we figured that out by calculating the atomic mass of that molecule. Okay? Not done yet, but that's our step towards getting done. All right? When, when it's all said and done, you're going to do this so much that I have students every year that it's like that's the first thing they do when they're working these problems. Even, they don't even use it sometimes in the problem, but then you just get so used to finding the atomic mass so that you know what the relationship which is, is between moles and grams. It just becomes automatic. Um, but you don't always have to calculate it, so don't assume when I give you a problem that you're going to need that. But you do need to know how to do this, and you're going to have lots of practice on it. Okay? Um, what they asked us is if we have 15.6 grams of magnesium chloride, how many moles is that? And this is where I said this stuff is just unit conversion. All right? We're converting from grams of MgCl2 to moles of MgCl2. How do I do that? Well, this is the relationship. Just like we'd say there are 12 inches in a foot, well, there are 95.21 grams in a mole when it comes to MgCl2, all right? That's our conversion relationship. So, you know, with conversion relationships, we can do, we can do it like this, where we say one mole MgCl2. That's the, that's the unit that we want to end up with, is moles of MgCl2, so you put that on top. The unit that we want to cancel out is, is the 95.21 grams of MgCl2. See how I'm just pulling that from here, because that's our unit conversion. Um, so you can write it like this. I prefer, you guys have seen me do this before, I prefer to write it like this. All right, that means the same thing. But the reason that I prefer to write it like that is, is become, gonna become apparent as we do more complicated problems, because um, otherwise you're having to do these little conversions and then you convert to another one and then you convert to another one. By doing it like this, it gives me the ability to do something else, convert something else out here. And I can just kind of do one, punch one long thing in my calculator and be done, all right? And that's how I prefer to write it. But all this means is this number here multiplied times this fraction here, one over 95.21, okay? Like I said, I want you to get in the habit, of, I want you to think of this as a unit conversion. And so in order to do that, you need to get in the habit of writing um, the unit as well as the compound that the unit refers to. So in this case, don't just think of it as 15.6 uh, grams. Think of it as 15.6 grams of MgCl2. Okay, so you notice that I wrote that on both of these. Um, I didn't just write one mole. I said one mole of MgCl2 is equal to 95.21 grams of MgCl2. And again, that's going to, as we do more complicated problems, you're going to see why that's so important. It just makes, it helps you make sure that your units are canceling out the way they're supposed to. Okay? So when I multiply this together, grams over mg, grams of mg cancel out, right? Because one's on the top of the fraction, the other one's on the bottom. And so when I punch that number in my calculator, I get a value of um, 0.164 moles of MgCl2, which is the unit that didn't cancel out, right? So that's how many moles of MgCl2 I have in 15.6 grams of MgCl2. Questions about that? So that's not the only thing it asked me for. The other thing it asked me for was what? Molecules. How many molecules do I have? Well, what's the... Again, this is just a conversion problem. How do I convert from moles to molecules? By using this conversion relationship. Because I know if I have one mole, then that means I have 6.02 times 10 to the 23 molecules. Okay? If I have one mole of these molecules, it means that I have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of them. All right? So I'm going to take that number there then, 0.164 moles of MgCl2, and I'm going to multiply that times this conversion relationship here, which says that if I have one mole of MgCl2, 
put that on the bottom because that's what I want to cancel out. Then it means that I have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of MgCl2. And so I, when I punch that in my calculator again, um, the correct units are going to cancel out. Moles of MgCl2 cancel out right here, and I'm left with 9.87 times 10 to the 22 molecules of MgCl2. So it's all about knowing what conversion relationships you have. You have this conversion relationship here, you have this conversion relationship here. And so I used both of those to convert from 15.6 grams to the values that they asked me for, right? Do you guys see that? So they, they, I started with grams. First they asked me how many moles. Well, I can't use this relationship because this relationship has to do with the number of moles of molecules with the uh, 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 one mole of molecules compared to a certain number of molecules. So there's no grams in this relationship, but there is in this one. This relationship here tells me the relationship between grams and moles. And so I use that, rela that conversion relationship to get the number of moles that 15.6 grams is equal to. And then once I calculated moles, now I have a relationship between uh, moles and molecules. When we're talking about molecules, that's what this number here refers to. And so I use that relationship here to convert from the number of moles to the number of molecules. Okay? All right, let's do one more. So this one started off with grams and said, how many moles do you have? Now the next problem, it starts off with moles and says, how many grams do you have? All right, so it says that we have a chemical calculation indicates that a reaction should produce 12.119 moles of nitrogen gas. 12.119 moles of nitrogen gas. What's my chemical formula for nitrogen gas? N2. N2. Is that, is that uh, the person behind the mask? <laughs> All right. Nobody cared who I was till I put on the mask. Let's figure that out if you don't know the movie reference. Um, 12.119 moles of N2, right? Nitrogen gas. Why N2? Because nitrogen is a homonuclear diatomic, right? So uh, the question is, how many grams of nitrogen is that? Well, the relationship that we know is, uh, we, first we calculate AMU, so N2 has an AMU of 2 times the atomic mass of N is 14.01. So that's going to equal 28.02 AMUs. And so that means that one mole of N2 equals 28.02 grams of N2. Right? Like I said, you're going to do that over and over and over again. You're going to have some molecule or some atom. You're going to figure out the AMU of it, and you're going to write down that relationship there. And now we can use that to convert from moles to grams or vice versa. In this case, we're converting from moles to grams. That's the question. How many grams of nitrogen will it produce? So we take 12.119. It's just a unit conversion. 12.119 moles of N2. What I put on the top of my fraction that I'm multiplying this by, the conversion relationship, which one? One goes on top and one goes on the bottom. Which one goes on top? That's right. I want to, the unit I'm asked to end up with is grams, right? That was the question. How many grams is this? So we put grams on top because we want, that, want to end up with that unit, and we put the number of moles on the bottom because that's the unit that cancels out. So moles of N2 on the bottom will cancel out with moles of N2 on the top, right? 
I'm just I'm I'm saying that because I want you to make people flip these all the time. And and if you know which unit you want to end up with, you're not going to make that mistake. So when I multiply that together, I cut, I get 339.6, 339.6 grams of nitrogen. So that's my final answer. Okay? Really good? Okay. Um, so we just got one more section here. I, I, I want to. I'm not going to quiz you guys on this, but I want you to at least be aware of it. Um, if we were to do experiment 7.1 in the book, we find out that some chemicals are very what they call hygroscopic. Okay, and so if it says that a, chem a compound or a chemical is hygroscopic, it means uh, this is how you spell that. Hygroscopic. If it's hygroscopic, that means that it that it readily absorbs moisture. Okay, so I mean it'll just absorb moisture from the air. And an example of that is copper sulfate. If you guys remember, we used copper sulfate when we did that experiment. Um, it was the blue powder. You know, when we were lighting stuff up, seeing which color it would produce. So the copper sulfate was one of the compounds that we used there. Uh, when, I, when I went to order copper sulfate online, uh, I think it had this on the bottle. I think it actually looked like this. So it was copper sulfate in the bottle, but what this says, because it's a hygroscopic compound, it, and which means it readily absorbs, absorbs moisture, it's that in that, um, in that powder that I had for every molecule of copper sulfate, it was surrounded by five molecules of water. And this actually probably, this may not be the powder one. This may be the one, it's probably the one that's in the liquid form, because you can order it like that as well. But um, anyway, it's got five water molecules around it. So if you see that, that's all that that means. Um, you may order, if, if, you, if you have to buy um, a particular compound, you guys aren't having to buy it in here, but um, if you ever see those, you may see that times so many molecules of water, and that's what, what it means. So just... He mentioned that in the book at this point, so I mentioned it to you at this point. All right. Let's talk about moles and chemical equations. I'm going to write down this, this chemical equation. N2 plus 3H2 yields 2N. H3. All right, so we've said this before with chemical equations. Think of these as recipes, right? And what this recipe says, uh, I told you this means that one molecule of N2, of nitrogen gas, right, combined together with three molecules of hydrogen gas will yield two molecules of NH3, which is ammonia. All right, so that's the recipe for making ammonia. You take one molecule of N2, combine it with three molecules of H2, you get two molecules of NH3. Well, what if I wanted to make four molecules of NH3? We said that these are chemical equations, and so they work the way algebraic equations do, right? So if I want to make four molecules, I'd have to multiply this by two, right? If I wanted to make twice as much, I'd multiply it by that. Well, whatever I multiply one side by, I have to multiply the other side by that. So now this chemical equation becomes that. So if I, if I wanted to make four molecules, that would be the chemical equation for making four molecules. All right? Why am I saying that? Well, it's because, it's because of what I told you earlier. In a lab, you can't work with individual molecules, right? They're just way too small. So what we work with instead is the number of moles. And as it turns out, um, because of this, because this is true, where if you multiply one side by one number, as long as you multiply the other side by the same number, you don't change the chemical equation. It means that we can think of these big numbers in front of these chemical equations as the number of moles. And that's something that we can work with in the lab, right? 
So just as I could say one molecule of this plus three molecules of this equals two molecules of that, I could also say one mole of N2 plus three moles of H2 will yield two moles of NH3. Okay, so that's actually how we're going to think about chemical equations in this class. So chemical equation gives the amount the amounts of reactants and products in moles. That's what the big numbers in the front represent. Bless you. We call those the stoichiometric coefficients. Isn't that fun to say? The stoichiometric coefficient. Remember when you have like in a in a algebraic equation 2a plus 3c equals 4b or something like that. The numbers in the front are called coefficients. And so since we're studying stoichiometry, the numbers in the front in our chemical equation are called stoichiometric coefficients. And so now, when we're, when we're dealing then with a chemical equation, what this means is that we have some additional conversion relationships. Right? We just learned the conversion relationship between moles and grams. Right? So for a given molecule or for a given element, you guys can tell me how many, how much, how what the mass is of, of uh, one mole of that element or one mole of that compound, right? We know how to calculate that. Yes, you, you guys do know how to do that, right? When we just did that. You follow me there? All right. Um, that's what we did by looking at the numbers, multiplying uh, on the periodic table, multiplying the, the, the number of atoms times the number of the atomic mass, and we came up with the AMU, and so we said one mole of this equals this many grams of that. So we know the, the relationship between moles and grams for an individual molecule or atom. That's one conversion relationship we've learned today. Another conversion relationship that we can gather now that we know this is we can say, well, if I have one mole of N2, one mole of N2 is going to, for this chemical equation, one mole of N2 is going to produce two moles of NH3. So now I have another conversion relationship that relates the moles of N2 to the moles of NH3. Again, this is only good for this chemical equation, all right? But for this chemical equation, I can also say that three moles, that number right there, three moles of H2, is always going to yield two moles of NH3 for this chemical equation. Now, both of these, I took you know, a compound from the left side and I related it to a compound on the right side. But it doesn't have to be like that. You can actually relate two compounds on the same side. Because again, for this chemical equation, it's always true that if I have one mole of N2, for this chemical equation, I'm always going to have three moles of H2. Okay? So since we had three compounds in our chemical equation, we can get from that three conversion relationships that we can use to convert from one thing to the next. Okay? Is that clear to everybody? So, for example, if I gave you this chemical equation and I said, instead of one mole of N2, we perform this chemical reaction here using two moles of N2, how much ammonia did we produce? You would say four, right? Because we used twice as much N2, so that yielded twice as much Ammonia. And so instead of two moles of ammonia, we got four moles of ammonia, right? And so we could actually write that down using the correct conversion relationship and for, for that particular one because I was asking about how N2 was related to NH3. Would you, we would use this conversion relationship. And I said we started with two moles of N2. How many moles of NH3 did that yield? Well, you would say two moles of N2, and then you would use this conversion relationship, and you'd say, I'm going to put the moles of N2 on the bottom, because that's what I want to cancel out. 
And what I want to be left with is two moles is the moles of NH3. So I would put that number on top. And then when I multiply that out, that would yield, these would cancel out. And that would give me a number of four moles of NH3. Okay. So now I know if I just asked you something for something simple like two moles of N2, you would be able to just in your head say it's four. But what if I gave you a complicated number? You need to be able to write this down so you can figure out the more complicated one, right? And so that's what the that's what the final problem we're going to do um, is is asking basically. So let's do that. Unless you've got some questions, example seven point four is what we'll finish with. Any questions about this? All right, example 7.4 says hydrogen peroxide decomposes into water and oxygen according to this balanced chemical equation. So they give us the equation. They tell us it's already balanced. All right. And uh, they want to know how many moles of water and oxygen are produced if we start with 12.18 moles of H2O2. So how much of this and how much of that if we start with this many moles of that? All right, so what, what conversion relationships do I know just because I know this chemical equation? Somebody tell me one. But not molecules, because we're, 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 we've learned oh, now that sorry. these, that's okay, we've learned these refer to moles, right? Mm -hmm. So two moles of what? H2O2. Yep, equals? Um, two moles of H2O. Very good. Somebody else give me a different relationship. And we're not necessarily going to use this, but... I'm just wanting to make sure you understand what all of the relationships are that we can gather from this chemical equation. Who can give me another one? Yes? Two moles of H2O2 equals one mole of O2. Exactly. Yep. Two big two in front of that, big one in front of that, right? So that's also true. And then there's one more conversion relationship. Who knows the last one? Like I said, you can also relate the compounds that are on the same side of the chemical equation. They, they don't have to be on opposite sides. So what's the relationship between water and O2 in this chemical equation? The relationship is that if we have two moles of water, right, then we have one mole of O2. So those are all conversion relationships that we can use to convert from one moles of one substance to the moles of another substance. Okay? All right. Specifically, what they asked us for in this one was, if we start with this many moles of H2O2, how many moles of this do we have? How many moles of this do we have? Well, we don't need this one then, because this is saying if I know the number of moles of H2O, then I can figure out the number of moles of O2. We don't know the number of moles of either of those. We know the number of moles of this. So I'm going to erase this one. We're not actually going to use that relationship. So let's, uh, let's find out first if I've got 12.18 moles of H2O2. 12.18 moles of H2O2. How many moles of water do I have in this for this chemical equation? And the relationship we're going to use is this one right here, right? So I want moles of H2O2 to cancel out, so I'm going to put that on the bottom. Two moles of H2O2 is equal to two moles of H2O. So my units cancel out like I would expect them to. And I'm, I've got the right unit on top here, which is what I'm going to end up with. And so my, my final answer for that is going to be 12.18 moles of H2O. So if I start with 12.18 moles of H2O2, then I end up with 12.18 moles of H2O. And this one's actually so simple, we could kind of eyeball that and see that. Right? It's a one-to-one -one ratio. For every two moles of this, I get two moles of that. And so if I started with 12.18 moles of this, I expect to end up with 12.18 moles of that. We could also figure out O2 the same way. If I, if I start with two moles of this, I end up with one mole of that. 
So basically, I always end up with half the number of moles of this as the number of moles I started with with this. So if, if I'm trying to find out how many moles of O2 I have, then it's going to be half of this number. So it would end up being what, 6.09? But, but let's actually write it out so you can see it written out. So, so how many moles of oxygen are we going to have? Well, we started with 12.18 moles of H2O2. Like I said, always write down both the unit whether it's mole or gram, bless you, moles, grams, whatever. Write that down, but also write down which compound it refers to. So 12.18 moles of H2O2, and we're going to multiply it by this conversion relationship to figure out the number of moles of O2. So we want to end up with moles of O2, so we put that on top. And we, uh, we want moles of H2O2 to cancel, that, cancel out, so we put that on the bottom. Right? That's just taking this conversion relationship right here and figuring out which one goes on the top and which one goes on the bottom. And so when I multiply that out, I get 6.09 moles of O2. So that's the number of moles of O2 I have. If I started with 12.18 moles of H2O2. Okay. Okay. Now, um, Punching this in your calculator, is everybody clear on that? Any questions about that? I just want to real quick talk to you about punching this in on your calculator. So sometimes that's where the mistake happens. Students get this piece, but they punch it in wrong. And as it gets more complicated, that's going to be more important. So um, no questions about what I did there? All right. What if I said, um, what if we were going to take this number? Let's, let's, let's say for whatever reason we didn't, we didn't have the rest of the information. Um, let's say we started with 12.18 moles of H2O2 and I wanted you to convert that first to the number of moles of O2 and then convert it to the number of moles of H2O. Well our relationship then here is um, our relationship between O2 and, and H2O, we said was that for every two moles of H2O, we have one mole of O2. And so if the final value I want to end up with is the number of moles of H2O, I can do two moles of H2O, put that on top right here, and put one mole of O2 on the bottom. And so you see when I do that, then moles of H2O2 cancel out with moles of H2O2 there. Moles of O2 cancel out with moles of O2 there, and the final unit that I'm left with is moles of H2O. And so punching that in my calculator will tell me how many moles of H2O2 I'm going to get. So this, this, this one you didn't need to do it because it was such a simple problem, but we're going to have problems in the future where we're going to have to string these together like that. All right. And so that's why I like to write it like this because it's easy to kind of see what's what and what's canceling out and all that. But if I'm punching this in my calculator, um, this is what I could punch in my calculator, 12.18, just do all the numbers on top first, 12.18 times 1, which is the number there, times 2, which is the number there, divided by 2, which is the number here, divided by 1, which is the number there. And if I punch that in my calculator, it's going to give me the correct answer. So just make sure that the numbers on the top of this, you do multiplies, multiplied by, and if it's on the bottom of this, you always do divided by, and if you do that, you'll end up with the correct answer, okay? Again, this one's simple enough, it's not that big a deal, but for the more complicated ones in the future, it's just nice to be able to do that. All right, final questions, yes? Um, when we're doing, when we're punching it into our calculator, uh -huh. would it be a good idea to do parentheses around the... You could, I mean, the other way you could do this using parentheses, right, is you could go, you could do 12.18 times Oops, times, and then you could do 1 divided by 2, right? And then times 2 divided by 1. You can do that too if you want to use parentheses. I just, it's just, to me, I'm, I'm going to, there's less chance of me making a mistake if I'm not having to enter in the parentheses. So I just wanted to make sure you guys understood that you could enter in like that. Okay? But yeah, parentheses are fine too. If that's what you're more comfortable with, definitely stick with that. All right. You guys have a good day. See you later.